Second Corinthians for Beginners. This is uh, lesson number six, the last in this series. Title of this lesson, Apostolic Defense. And uh, we're going to begin in Second Corinthians chapter 10. And Lord willing, make our way to chapter 13, verse 14. So in this uh, final section of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul is going to drive home his point on two issues that we've been uh, talking about. First, the validity of his own apostleship. And secondly, the danger presented by false teachers. These, these are the two main topics here of this, uh, of this letter. He'll also do this by explaining why he is a true apostle in comparison to the false teachers who are, as we have mentioned previously, causing trouble in Corinth. And then we'll see him actually exercise his apostolic authority over the church. Something we, don't, we rarely see in other epistles where an apostle actually says, I'm going to you know, use my authority and use it to discipline. So we begin with uh, Paul defending his um, apostleship. Up to now he has been dealing with problems and questions that the Corinthians had concerning his visits with them and matters going on within the church. Now he gets personal and um, goes to the real point and that is the legitimacy of his own apostleship versus the legitimacy of those who were claiming to be superior to him at Corinth. So we had some men, some teachers there in Corinth that had crept in and who were claiming that they were the true apostles. They were super apostles and were trying to undercut his authority and discredit him by criticizing him and by you know, sowing discord among the brethren at that place. And the unfortunate thing was the people there were buying into that. And they were questioning Paul's sincerity simply because he had made a change of travel plans. So we talked about that last time. So the first issue is, how do you measure an apostle? How do you do that? So Paul describes the way one is to determine if one is a, an apostle in the first place. And he gives four things, criteria. If you want to find out who is an apostle, here's some things that apostles have and apostles do. First of all, they have spiritual power. Chapter 10, verse one to six, let's read. Now I, Paul myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying the speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. So they confused his gentle attitude with weakness, but they didn't realize the power he exercised as an apostle in the spiritual realm. In other words, they were just judging him as a, as a man, as a physical man. So to, dis, to destroy the work of Satan, he's talking about, required true spiritual power, which he possessed. And he says that he's going to exercise this power for those who continue in disobedience when he arrives. And, the, and the, the, the unsaid thing underneath that is that the true villain here is not just the, the teachers, the true villain here is not just the people who have been kind of you know, roped into their thinking, influenced by their thinking. He's saying here the true, te the true villain here is Satan. He's the one that's doing this. And so he said, apostles exercise power over spiritual powers, something that mere men do not have. Um, a second criteria, if you wish, how to measure an apostle, uh, their position in relationship to, uh, to Christ. That's another way to measure who is a sincere apostle or a true one. 
Let's read that, verse seven. He says, you are looking at things as they are outwardly, the flesh. If anyone is confident in himself that he is in Christ's, let him consider this again with himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also um, are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame, for I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. So Paul says that as a Christian and an apostle, he is also in Christ or united to Christ as they are. You know, all those who have been baptized into Christ, you know, become with Christ. In addition to being related to Christ as they are, he also has received authority for building up the church. That's a special authority. The point here is that this authority is directly from Christ. It's not given to him through man. And he uses the idea of authority to string together the next idea. And the next idea is the next criteria, and that is how to measure an apostle, spiritual power, position in relation to Christ, a chosen apostle. And then thirdly, deeds done through Christ. Let's, let's compare the deeds here. So verse 10, it says, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. The, he's quoting here what the uh, troublemakers are saying about him in Corinth. And basically what they're saying about him, he's not much of a speaker. You know, I mean, maybe he writes pretty good letters, but when he's there in person, you know, he just mumbles about, fumbles about. He's not, he's not, he's not dynamic. Can this guy be really an apostle of Christ? Just you know, undynamic as he is in, in person? That's the argument. So as a, an apostle, uh, or rather an apostle is essentially measured by what he does. His authority gives him the right and the power to do what he has done or threatening to do among them. But he's not using this to frighten them, but rather to remind them that he can do what he writes about in his letters. If he says in his letters, I'm going to discipline when I get there, he's saying to them, be careful because I can do this. I can carry out my threat. And if you think for a minute, I think he may you know, mention a little later on, this is the same person that granted to them the ability to speak in tongues and to do other wonders. He gave them this power. And he's saying, look, if I can do that, if I can do that for you, imagine what I can do if I decide to discipline you. So it's the old story, you know, walk softly but carry the big stick. Well, he's got the big stick of power that he's threatening to use against them. How to measure an apostle, spiritual power, position in relationship to Christ, deeds done through Christ, ministry for Christ. What have I done in the name of Christ, for Christ? So we have a catalog of these, verse 12 and 13, he says, for we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. He starts out by saying, we don't just talk about ourselves and measure ourselves by our own words. We measure ourselves by what we've done in the service of Christ. Don't go by what I say, go by what I've done. You, the Corinthian church, are an example of our ministry. We measure our work by you, what we have accomplished in you. That's, remember I said before, here's the guy who gave these, not only brought them to Christ, but uh, you know, enabled many of them to exercise spiritual power. Let's keep going, verse 14. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come, even as far as you, in the gospel of Christ. It is not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you. In other words, we established you, we preached the gospel to you, you're there because of us. So our boast is not in us, our boast is you. 
When anybody wants to say, yeah, what have you done? We point to you and say, this is, what, this is what we've done. That church, those gifts, those things that are taking place, we did that through the power of Christ. That's how we measure ourselves. Verse 16, he says, so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. He said, these are the guys, they've come in, they're trying to undermine me, they're trying to discredit me and trying to take over my work. Don't you realize you, you people, you're my work. And not only you, but other works that we've done beyond you. So if you want to measure how legitimate I am as an apostle, not, look not only to yourselves, look at all the other churches we've planted. Philippi, Athens, you know. So unlike the false teachers who are taking credit for his work, he says, we hope one day you will grow to the point where you will support us to go plant another church in an area where the gospel hasn't been preached before. Something that the false teachers did not do in Corinth and had no plans in doing in the future. They weren't interested in going planting other churches, they just wanted to take over this church and lord over it. So true apostles were to go out to all creation to preach the gospel, not just try and steal another man's work. That's, what he's, you know, that's the bottom line of what he's saying here. So he summarizes this section, verse 17 and 18. He says, but he who boasts is to boast in the Lord, for it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. It's a quote from Jeremiah summarizes his feeling about his apostleship. It's been received from the Lord, it's been authorized by the Lord, it's been empowered by the Lord, it's been done for the Lord. Is there any praise? Well, sure. Is it a praiseworthy work? Absolutely, he says. But the praise should go to the Lord. You know, I, I, I meaning Paul, you know, I, I was a servant to you. I brought you the gospel. I encouraged you, I empowered you, I taught you, but this, everything I've given to you, I've received from the Lord. And so if there's any praise, it ought to go to the Lord. Again, what's not said here, the other guys, they're taking the praise for themselves. Compare that, he says. So if anyone is praising himself, it is a sure sign that he is a false apostle, because apostles you know, are too connected to Christ to simply praise themselves for the work they do in Christ. All right, so now we move on to another issue. So the, the, the larger issue here in this section is Paul's defending his apostleship. Now he goes on, he moves a step further. He was talking about himself, now he's going to talk about the false apostles, a condemnation of these false apostles. He speaks plainly of the character and motives of those who claim to be, quote, superior as apostles in the Corinthian church. So he calls them out. He calls them out. First of all, he says they are being seduced by false teachers. I mean, the Corinthians. These guys are false teachers, he said. We move on to chapter 11. He says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. But indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. So he uses the imagery of marriage here to tell them that they're being seduced into being unfaithful to their original husband, Jesus, and following someone else. Because they're not teaching what Jesus taught and they're not teaching it in the spirit of Christ. So he wonders at how easily they're being led astray by a different Lord, a different spirit, a different gospel. He said, you bear this beautifully, it's a little, Sarcastic, actually. Don't you love to be seduced by false teachers? You know, today we'd say, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> Again, I, I keep coming back to the analogy of a parent with a child. 
a child who's you know, got a brand new bike and, a, you know, and had an ice cream cone for dessert and uh, has got two days off of school, nothing to do and sitting there in the living room whining. And the parents say, what's wrong with you? You, you got a brand new bike, you had ice cream for dessert, your, your homework's done, what's your, what's your problem? Well, he's, what's your problem? You have spiritual gifts. You've been taught by an apostle. You're, you're, you know, what's your problem? So easily led away. Just any old person come along and whoop. Again, the parenting thing is, well, Billy's, dad's, Billy's dad you know, allows him to drive in the traffic, that type thing. Yeah. Second thing he says about them, the accusations against Paul, verse five and six, or five to 12 rather, but I'm just going to read five and six here. He says, for I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles, but even if I am unskilled in speech, he admits it himself. Okay, I'm not a dynamic speaker, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we have made this evident to you in all things. So it's the accusations against Paul, he's saying, are false. What accusations? Well, that he is inferior somehow. And his answer is, eminent here doesn't refer to Peter or the other apostles. He's not saying, I'm just as good as those other apostles, Peter and James, you know, uh, you know, I'm just as good as those apostles. He's not saying that. Eminent refers to these people who um, are, are teaching in Corinth. They're the ones that are calling themselves eminent, superior. He says, I'm in no way inferior to these quote, eminent apostles. He may be soft-spoken. Maybe he's not trained in the tactics of oral debate, but his knowledge speaks for itself. Another idea of accusations against him, that he is not illegitimate as an apostle because he doesn't take money to preach for them. You know, we read between the lines that the people who were there were professional speakers and orators, which was common in those days. Professional speakers and orators would kind of stake out a position and they would debate a position or incur, you know, uh, you know, teach a certain position from place to place. This was very uh, popular in Greek society. And it seems that some of the ones that had crept in had this mindset. Let's get rid of the local guy and we'll step in and you know, we'll take over this group with our ideas. So he's saying, I'm no less you know, influential, powerful, knowledgeable than these quote super apostles. He preached to them for free. Oh, the thing I forgot to mention was they got paid money for this. You know, they made money doing this from going from place to place. So he says to them, he preached to them for free and will continue to do so to prove that he is sincere and to give no chance for them to accuse him. To accuse him of what? Well, to accuse him for doing it for the money. If I come in and preach, support myself, you can't accuse me of doing this for money. I'm doing it simply for the love of God, love of Christ, the need to proclaim the gospel. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? I robbed other churches. Of course, he's, you know, he didn't actually rob them, but that's the term he's using. I begged for money for, from other churches so I could preach to you for free without charge, he said. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. Well, isn't that what we do with missionaries? It's what we do with Bible talk. We offer, you know, there must be at least five to eight years of free adult Bible curriculum on video, online, and it doesn't cost a church a dime for free. They can watch it for free, they can download it for free, they can copy it for free, they can distribute it for free. It's all free. Why though? Well, because the Choctaw Church supports me. And dozens of individuals and many, many other churches in our brotherhood support Bible talk. Why? Because they want us to offer the, the, you know, the service that we do. They want us to do that for free. 
So no one can say, oh, they're doing, you know, how am I? They're doing it for the money. There's no money. That's why even online, YouTube, uh, we have no ads. We could put ads. If you have 150,000 views a month, you could put ads, you make some money. We don't put ads, no ads. It's always free in every way. So in the same way, Paul is saying here, look, we, we robbed, we went to other churches begging for money so we could preach the gospel to you for no money. He says, and when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to, um, to do so. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows, he says. God knows I do. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. They want the same position that we have, but they want to charge you for it. Can't you see what's going on here? So in verses 13 to 15, he summarizes this section. He says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Wow, talk about a smackdown. Remember I told you before, between the lines, the real troublemaker here is not these guys, the real troublemaker is Satan. He's the one that's trying to disrupt this church. And the best way to disrupt the church is by attacking its leadership. So he calls the teachers what they are. They're false messengers. They're deceitful workers. In other words, they're hypocrites. Uh, they're actors pretending to be apostles. He compares their strategy to that of Satan and their judgment to his also. You know, Satan's ultimate lie and hypocrisy is parading himself as an angel of light. In other words, a force for good in this world. Always that way. I mean, if he paraded himself as a force for evil, uh, he wouldn't get that many followers. But many times he portrays himself as a force for good and people just swallow it. Usually people who don't know the gospel, who will swallow some other kind of philosophy or idea or social engineering plan. So he compares their st strategy to Satan. And in other words, these people Bottom line, they're, certain, they're servants of the devil. They're not servants of Christ. So then he moves on and he's going to talk about the marks of true apostleship. He shows these guys are false and this is how they work. Okay, now, what about a true apostle? What are the marks of a true apostle? <laughs> well, he starts suffering. You think he would have started, well, first of all, they got a degree from a good Jewish Hebrew you know, university or something, you know, as a fair, he doesn't start there. Suffering, he says, that's the mark of a true apostle. Verse 16 to 23. He's done this before in chapter four, but this time he goes into detail about the things that he has suffered because he's an apostle. And I'm not going to read, it's too long a section, so I've just listed the things that he suffered, that he talks about. Well, the first thing he talks about is that he's, he's considered a fool. Who has done that to him recently? Well, the Corinthians have done that to him recently. He's considered illegitimate. Who's done that recently? Well, the Corinthians have done that recently. But even beyond that, 29 lashes five times, beaten with rods three times, stoned once, shipwrecked three times. We read about one shipwreck, in the book of Acts, but he said he's been shipwrecked three times. In danger from thieves and false brethren, often hungry and thirsty, the stress as a church leader, hunted by Damascus city officials, not to mention the Jewish leadership who had tried to kill him on several occasions. All of this he has suffered, why? Because he's an apostle of Christ. Not because he's a thief or a murderer or dangerous or an insurrectionist, no, because he's preaching the gospel. 
So the false teachers, they boast in their intelligence, super apostles, we got a better gospel for you. Their position, but Paul boasts in the things that he has suffered on account of the gospel. He's saying, look, take a look at my scars. You want my resume? I'll show you my resume and I'll take off my shirt. You can see the uh, scars on my back. That's my resume. The implication is, of course, that he has paid the price as an apostle and they have not paid that price. They want to be paid. <laughs> they want to be paid. And he said, all of this here, I've suffered that for no money. At least if he said, but you know, in the end, I got rich. I can retire. <laughs> yeah, no money. They don't give you money after they've beaten you or tried to kill you. Another mark, communion with Christ. He says, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in my uh, regard to my um, uh, regard to my weakness, for, I, uh, for if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of this surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. Boy, we can unpack this here for a week. What they cannot pretend is to have spoken with Christ. That's the point. To have been in the presence of Christ. That's his point. As a true apostle, he has spoken with the Lord and here he talks about a heavenly experience reminiscent of Isaiah or Ezekiel in the Old Testament prophets and John the apostle you know, in Revelation. The other apostles physically were with the Lord, touched him, ate with him, taught by him, saw the mirror, you know, they were with him. Paul was not. And so one of the accusations against him may have been, is he really an apostle? Because he, he was a Johnny come lately. You know, he was a kind of, you know, Jesus you know, rose to heaven and Paul, he wasn't converted till after. What's his big deal? I thought only people who actually saw Jesus could be apostles. There's a good argument. And so he says to them, yeah, I saw Jesus. And he says, I don't want to boast. So he, he speaks of himself in the third person when he talks about the vision. You know, I knew a man, that's him. He says, I, I, I don't want to boast too much, but I knew a man who was taken up into the third heaven. The Jews believed in layers. You know, third heaven is where God is. Who spoke to Christ, who heard things who was taught directly from God. That's his answer to the accusation that perhaps he's not legitimate because he didn't, you know, he didn't interact with Christ himself. Okay. So as a true apostle, he's spoken with the Lord and he talks about a heavenly experience, reminiscent, as I said, of the Old Testament prophets. He's too humble to boast about this and he gives a rare glimpse into his personal sufferings and how he coped but the point is that only an apostle could truly speak of such things. He shows his true apostolic character in that he doesn't use these things to boast as they would. He uses them to give glory to God. Another mark of true apostleship, miraculous power. Verse 11. 
I have become foolish. You yourselves compelled me. You know, it's your fault if I'm talking like this. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. The signs of true apostles were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. For in what respect were you treated as inferior to the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not become a burden to you? Forgive me for this wrong. <laughs> Again, you know, mom saying to her kid, I'm so sorry I gave you ice cream. Here I was thinking you'd be happy. <laughs> uh, he's saying, you know, I performed miracles in your presence. I enabled you to perform miracles. Oh, I'm so sorry for having burdened you with that. And I did it for free. And these guys are charging you money to hear them teach and, and speak, but they haven't done that. They haven't given you anything like I gave you. So the marks, according to Paul, are suffering, an actual communion with Christ and displayable power, not just talk about power, displayable power. Anybody can say that they've seen Christ, but only the ones who can actually perform the signs and wonders can confirm their words with action. You don't believe me that I was in the, you know, the third heaven, that I spoke with Christ, that I heard things and so on. You don't believe me? Think back when I was with you, the signs and wonders that I performed among you, the abilities that I gave you, think back to that and ask yourself, where did I get that power if not from Christ? So he also reminds them and chastises them for not recognizing these signs and instead of defending himself as he is doing now, he should have been praised and encouraged by them, especially since they received blessings from him freely. So instead of praising me or commending me, you're criticizing me. So in his last section, he brushes aside these false teachers and he takes his rightful place as an apostle and he exercises his rightful authority among them. So we'll keep going. He says, first of all, I'm, I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back, he says. Verses 14 to 18, I'm not going to read that right now. He's going to come to them again out of love and they are not to worry, it will not cost them anything for him nor for his fellow ministers who never took advantage of them either. So I will come to you. There was some dispute about his travel plans, but I will come to you, but I'll do it you know, in love. In verse 19 to 21, he says he encourages them to be ready for him to arrive. He hopes they'll be ready for his arrival and they will have repented of their sins. He's not defending himself, he's building their faith before God. In chapter 13, verses one and two, he warns them. He warns them that he will punish the sinners, all of them. And he keeps on going. He reminds them of his power, verses three to six. They confuse his mild appearance with lack of power. He says that Christ also seemed weak because of his crucifixion, but was empowered by God to resurrect. That was the main, well, there were other accusations, of course, against Christ, but one of them was, well, he can't be the Messiah. Are you kidding me? The Messiah nailed to a piece of wood? That's no Messiah. That's not the Messiah we're waiting for. He has no power. And they said that for three days in a row <laughs> until the grave was empty until he said what was going to happen actually happened. He was raised from the dead. So in the same way, Paul says, he will be empowered by God when he will be among them for disciplining them in Christ. You watch. If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and demonstrated that power, you better believe that when I get there, God will also give me the power to discipline you. I mean, you've got to have a lot of confidence to be able to say that. When he examines himself, he sees the power of Christ working in him and he asks them, do they see the power of Christ working in them? In verses seven to 10, he challenges them to choose. He wants them to do right and obey him, not to prove that he's right, but rather so that they may do what is the right thing. 
I, I don't want you to choose me over these guys, he says. I want you to choose me so that you will continue following the correct teaching because these people are you know, leading you into error. And I want you to demonstrate your maturity. Your maturity in the sense that you're able to discern between false and truth, right and wrong. And right now you're choosing false over, falsehood over truth. And that's not a mark of maturity. And he wants them to avoid punishment because I'll punish you, he says. It's their choice. His visit can be one of a blessing or it can be of punishment. They get to choose. And so he finishes out with the salutations, chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. The chapter finishes with a series of actual positive encouragements. He tells them to rejoice. They mature, that they mature and be united together, that they be encouraged, that they be at peace, that they enjoy God's love. All of these things follow if they follow what is true, what is right. And he says to, uh, you know, to offer each other the sign of Christian brotherhood in those times, which was the holy kiss. The holy kiss in that culture, the men kiss the men, the women kiss the women. There was no, the men kiss the women. You know how we do a little, a little hello kiss, you know? and in Montreal, I remember it was the two cheek kiss, 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 the European style. And I remember in Montreal, <laughs> it used to take forever. Can you, ever, you know how long it takes to get started when a hundred people are kissing each other on the cheek? You know, it's, it's, a long, uh, it's a long thing. So I'm glad we don't have that, 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 that um, tradition here. Just a handshake or a hug is fine. But in those days, uh, you know, the, the, the holy kiss. He sends a, a, a greeting from the other churches and a blessing for the entire, from the entire Godhead upon them. So that's the text. Uh, seven lessons uh, on leadership, and I want to take the time for that, that we get from 2 Corinthians. Key lessons and ideas from 2 Corinthians about leadership. First of all, apostleship is real work. He cared for the poor. He was managing that collection for Jerusalem. He was a teacher. He sent epistles. He gave training to Titus. Uh, dispute resolution, resolution, preaching, church planting. What's the lesson there? The lesson is church leadership is hard work. Because <laughs> church leaders do this kind of work to this day. Some people think it's just about having a meeting. Well, there are meetings, but there's all of this here. Another lesson, apostles were appointed. These fake apostles, they were self-appointed. And that should have been the first tip off for the, uh, for, the, uh, uh, you know, for the church that these guys were phony. Leaders are appointed by, uh, to their task by someone in authority. Elders are uh, elders in churches that have no elders. Elders are raised up and appointed by the evangelist. Evangelists, when they're starting out, are appointed by elders. It's, it's a cycle. Deacons are selected by the church and confirmed by the elders. Nobody ever gets up and says, well, I think today, I think I feel like being a deacon today. So I'm, going to, I'm appointing myself to be the deacon of something. It doesn't work that way. Everybody is appointed by someone else. So they were self-appointed. Um, uh, number three, apostles suffered. Paul repeated this often, that, uh, that his dues for apostleship was suffering. You cannot lead without suffering. I don't care who you are and what position you have. If you're a deacon, you're going to suffer. What suffer? Well, you're going to get the call at two in the morning, there's a flood in the building. That, that, you're going to suffer a night's, you know, no sleep that night. Or you're going to work hard to do something and put your all into it and even spend some of your own resources to do it. And after it's done and you're happy, you fixed something or made something, you'll be criticized. Oh yeah, but you didn't do it this way. Oh, well, I don't like that color. You, know, you, bought, you, know, you bought green, I thought red would be better. You know? Preachers are what people have for lunch at times. Elders are constantly criticized, undermined. I mean, if you're going to be a leader in the church, you, you step up, you're, you're appointed to your role, and then the first thing that happens to you is someone comes up and kind of paints a bullseye on you, because <laughs> we want to know where to shoot when it's time. So by all means, aspire to leadership because there's a great blessing that comes from it, from the Lord and from the church. 
but there's no leadership without suffering. So if you're a leader and you suffer and you decide you want to quit because you're suffering, you didn't get it to begin with. I mean, you didn't get the idea to begin with. Apostles also acted like apostles. Apostolic conduct was unmistakable in its sincerity and holiness and humility. Leaders must act like leaders. We expect the, we, we expect the leaders not to be perfect, obviously, they're sinful men. We are sinful men. But there are certain things that you kind of have gotten a hold of in your life. You know, I used to smoke, I, I, I picked tobacco because it's such an easy thing, but I used to smoke, I loved smoking. Oh man, it was my favorite hobby was smoking. But then when I became a Christian, you know, I still smoked. And, but it didn't take long before I understood, boy, all those sermons about holiness and all those sermons about self-control. And you know, if I wanted to move forward in this Christianity thing, something had to go. How, how, how would you feel if I was up here you know, speaking to you and I, I did this like this and you saw my package of cigarettes right here? How would you feel if I gave the exact same lesson and in between you know, the the class and the sermon, I was out in the side over here, phew, taking a smoke, just having a little smoke between, <laughs> between Bible class and worship. How would you feel? It'd be the same me, it'd be the same notes. Yeah, sure, you expect the leaders in the church to have gotten a hold of some of the basic stuff at least. I still, you know, I'm not truthful at times. I still have bad thoughts and you know, I still think, wow, how, you actually thought that? Yeah, you know, yeah, I still have that. But some of the basics, man, you, you got to get a hold of it before you, you know, move up to lead others in spiritual matters. Apostolic ministry is evident. To his accusers, Paul simply offered his work as a response. Leaders' actions always, always, always speak louder than their words. Don't do what I say, don't copy what I say, do what I am doing. Apostles loved the church. Paul was continually helping the church, not only in spiritual matters, but also in benevolent one as well. As well. You know, the special collect. He was an apostle, he did miracles. And yet he took the time to collect money for poor people in Jerusalem. And so leaders lead by supporting and nourishing the weak members. Finally, apostles have authority. In the end, Paul warns them to obey his words because he had the power to back up his authority in Christ. Leaders, in the same way, don't have miraculous power, but they have the authority to lead. They do have the authority to discipline. They do have the authority to appoint and to encourage, and the church will not grow if leaders do not exercise their leadership, and if the congregation does not submit to their leadership. Very, very important. It's a cooperative thing. We respect the idea that our elders, again, they are men as we are, they're human beings as we are, but they have received an eldership, not just from the church, they've received it from the Lord through the agency of the church, but it's from the Lord. So we respect that concept. And especially as they come together and hopefully make good decisions on behalf of the church, we respect those decisions. Maybe not because, well, he's the smartest guy, he's got the most, no, because together they come and represent what God has given us as leadership in the church. So it's a two way, you know, they exercise their leadership, we exercise our enthusiastic support of that leadership, and when that happens, believe me, the church moves forward. You know, we make mistakes, we have some false starts, that's fine, but the church does move forward. I've been you know, witnesses of church breakups and it's always one of, the, one of the two things. The elders are divided among themselves or they're not leading or the church refuses to follow their leadership. And when that happens, boom, that's it. You, you can't do anything. You can't get anything done. Okay, so that's the uh, last lesson in uh, 2 Corinthians. I do appreciate your attention to this. Pick it up another time with another book. Thank you.